Thank you so much. I'm honored and delighted to be here today. Um, I love listening to the uh, previous speakers as well, and I thought, gee whiz, let's see. We had Nancy talk about women physicians in the media. We had Sarah Lynn talk about sex and uh, space, and now I guess I must be sex in the White House um, <laughs> as Bill Clinton's doctor. Um, my goals are threefold today. Uh, I'm obviously the uh, last speaker before the break, so I want to make it entertaining and enlightening and memorable for all of you. But I want to share with you my journey to the White House because in a lot of ways, I'm singing to the choir. You know, we all know the same tune. It's just our lyrics are a little bit different. So I want to share that with you. But also, what did I learn from being there for nine years? I'd be happy to share that. And finally, to share with you hope that there's life after the White House and it actually can be bigger and better than what you ever imagined. So I'm a big believer in their journey in our lives and that things happen for a reason and we become the women we are, the professionals we are because of the journey that we take in our life. And my journey began in a very unusual place where most White House doctors don't begin, it began overseas. This is a photograph of uh, me taken when I was two years old. I'm the second little girl from the left. And late at night, this is the type of photo you see uh, when you're up late at night, and it's the care package photo. You see it, you say, oh my goodness, those are a bunch of kids in a third world country. Quick, get your checkbook. We need to donate some money to them. And so that is my care package photo. I was two years old. My parents are Filipino. My father was in the US Navy, and when I was two, we moved to Pearl Harbor, where my dad was stationed. But I always begin with the fact that we all have a beginning, but I always find that it's what really counts is the journey and where we wind up in life. So I, I started in a very unusual place for White House doctors. So I remember most of my life as vivid color, and that really is my American journey. This is my fifth birthday party in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And it follows my basic theme of trying to fit in. And I, I know none of you have struggled with that, right? Like trying to fit in. Uh, and it's a little bit of a challenge when your height, your gender, your last name, the way you look doesn't fit in with everybody else. And here I am at the age of five trying to fit in with the obligatory pink frilly dress, uh, trying to match the other girls in the neighborhood. And I, I realized I did fit in there. The only one who doesn't fit in is my little brother who still is trying to fit in. That's, that's sort of a family story with us. But I really found that my true passion, as many of you have found in yours, is education. And that was the key to, uh, to success, was education. This photo was taken when I wore a younger woman's hair, last, last time I wore younger woman's hair, and was at my high school commencement in San Diego, California, when I was a graduation speaker back in the 70s. And my sons uh, joke with me now, they said, Mom, it's not such a big deal that you were valedictorian of your class back in the 70s in Southern California, because everybody knew back then that half your class was stoned or drunk. So, but. <laughs> I said, you still have to be bigger and better than the competition, and, and I did not inhale at that time. <laughs> Many of my opportunities really came through the military. My father and mother couldn't afford to send me to medical school, so I enrolled in the military medical school in Bethesda, which was a full scholarship, which was amazing for me. It gave me 24 years of an incredible career, of which I'm most grateful. But it also taught me many things about what you do as a physician, as well as a leader, and I'm going to share that with you today. I'm known really as the White House doctor, and people look at me, and the thing they want to know is, how did I ever get there? How did you ever get that job? So let me share with you that story. The year was 1991. I was living in San Diego, California. I was in the Navy. I was head of internal medicine at the Navy hospital there. I was married to my first husband, which is a whole different story. Um, we had two little boys, lived three houses down from my parents. And at that time, if you looked at my resume and what was going on, you thought, oh, your life is good. You're head of internal medicine, you know, your work, you know, you've got a great career ahead of you. But something within me was unsettled. I was trying to decide whether I wanted to stay in or get out. Is this really one that I wanted to do the rest of my life? Be in the hospital wards, work in clinic all day. 
and I really was, I was at a point in my career, I, I, I needed to make a change, and it so happened, I had fulfilled my 10-year commitment to the military, and I had to decide whether I wanted to stay in or get out. And my husband suggested that at that time, his law firm was going on a retreat to Palm Springs, and he said, listen, let's leave, your, leave our kids with your folks, your mom and dad, who are our neighbors, let's go to Palm Springs and you make a decision about what you want to do with your career. So it was a good decision. So we go off to Palm Springs, and I remember at that time I was exhausted, you know, working late hours, coming home, taking care of the kids. My husband, same thing over and over again, back to the hospital the next day, on and on and on. And, and I remember getting a massage that day uh, that I was there, and I thought, oh, this is great. This is a great thing for me. And then going down into the grand ballroom of the Ritz-Carlton, I walked down into the ballroom. I met the law partners at the time, and they were all male back in the uh, 80s. And I had met them, shook hands, and then I turned and I looked at their wives. And I realized they were tanned, they were rested, they had time for Pilates and yoga, they had time to be with their kids and take them to school. And I, I looked at my husband, I said, you know what, I've made my decision, I know what I'm going to do next. And he goes, what is it? I said, I'll get out of the Navy, you make law partner, and I will become a trophy wife. I want to be a trophy wife. And he says, okay, let's do that. So we go back to San Diego that weekend, Monday morning, I go back to the Navy hospital, I go down to the Office of Personnel, and I ask for the papers for release from active duty, because in those days, you couldn't just say, I quit, I'm out of the Navy. You had to submit your paperwork in triplicate, and then it goes to Washington, D.C., and then nine months later, they let you out of the Navy. So I had the papers on my desk, I'm looking at the paperwork, and it dawns on me that I'm divorcing the military. I had known the military all my life. My father was career in the Navy. I'd gone to the military medical school, I had done 10 more years, and I was going to divorce the military. I said, well, if this is what I want to do, that's what, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm looking at the paperwork, and my phone rings, and it's the chairman of internal medicine, my boss. And he doesn't know I'm trying to get out, he just called me. And he said, Connie, I've just received the message traffic from Washington, D.C., and I'm to nominate six candidates for the position of White House doctor to represent the Navy and I'd like to nominate you among the six candidates from the Navy. And I said, well, I've never heard of that position. And he says, well, here, let me go through the criteria, you know, board certified in internal medicine, uh, at least 10 years active duty, you did time on board a ship for two years, uh, passed a security clearance, and on. And he says, I think you'd be really good, and I've got, uh, I have a list of six names, and I want to submit that to the White House. And we, you know, we have a doctor there representing the White House now from the Navy. We have one for the Air Force, one for the Army. It's a two-year assignment. I said, well, I'm very honored, but let me talk to my husband. I hang up. I call my husband down at his law firm. I tell him about this change in opportunity. And the first thing out of his mouth is, are you crazy? You hate Washington, D.C. You grew up there in the 60s. You know very well it's hot and humid in the summer. It's cold and miserable in the winter. But most important of all, they don't have good Mexican food like they do here in San Diego. <laughs> it's all about the food. I said, you know, you're right. You're right. And he says, plus, you're going to be a trophy wife, right? I said, you're right. So I hang up. I'm getting ready to call my boss. And as I'm doing that, my pager goes off. And it's my husband trying to reach me. And I said, call him back, and I said, what is it? And he says, well, you know what? On second thought, you have nothing to lose anyway. You'll never get this job anyway. I want you to know I divorced him 14 years later. Uh, two lessons is, number one, the most important thing you do in your life is your life's calling, your mission, what you plan to do with your life. Number two is your life partner. Make sure you have your biggest fan as your life partner. So anyway, you'll never get this job anyway, but it is a good resume item in case you decide to work part-time for Kaiser here in California. I said, well, thank you. So go ahead and put your name in. So I hang up, submit my name. Nine months later, I'm in Washington, D.C. It's Christmas time. I'm walking around being interviewed, interviewed by security, because you have to do a security clearance, interviewed by the members of the White House Medical Unit. And I'm looking at the five other guys who've been chosen to be interviewed along with me. And there are five male candidates. And I look at them, and I realize they are all clones of Tom Cruise out of Top Gun. Okay, uh, 
you know, Ivy League school, Naval Academy, surface warfare, flight surgeon. One of them is so confident that he's going to get the job because he's going to be the best man at the wedding of the guy we're going to replace. Because you all know it's who you know in Washington. And so, you know, he's practically, you know, passing out his business cards. And I realized, you know, I don't know anybody in Washington. So I thought, well, am I their token female, Asian, whatever, whatever, I'm just going to do this interview. I'm not going to get this job anyway. So I get interviewed by the members of security, by the medical unit, and then the final interview for each of us individually is with a Dr. J. Burton Lee III, who was the physician to the president of George Herbert Walker Bush and the head of the medical unit back then. He was a senior doctor. And before the days of Google, I had done a literature search on Dr. Lee because one of the things they advise you is when you're going to be interviewed, you try to find something in common with the person interviewing you. So you have some point of reference. Well, I realized we had one thing in common. We had nothing in common. <laughs> he had gone to school on the East Coast, had gone to Andover with George Sr., had a home in the Hamptons, home in the Vineyard, uh, Ivy League. I think the only Filipinos he knew were the guys who served in the White House mess where my people came from. So nothing in common. I'm not going to get this job. So anyway, I get uh, introduced, I get marched into the ground floor of the White House by the incumbent physician, Dr. Roberts, and he says, Connie, have a seat, I'm going to go introduce you to Dr. Lee for your interview. So he has me sit down, he goes to the doorway, and the following interchange occurs. He says, Dr. Lee, I have our next candidate here. And there is a voice on the other end that says, well, did you bring her resume, her paperwork? And Dr. Roberts goes, oh my goodness, I forgot it in the other building. And all of a sudden, there's the sound of books or something being thrown across the room, hitting a wall, and the voice goes very gruff. Well, never mind, I'll make the decision without it. Dr. Roberts pulls away from the door, he looks at me and he says, you're on. I said, thanks for warming up, you know, my warm up act. So I stand up, I take a deep breath, and they always tell you, center yourself, breathe, be in the now. And if your palms are sweaty, just wipe them on your skirt or your pants. And as I did this, I tried to collect myself, but I also said, some, I do something often, and that's pray. And what I did was I said a silent prayer. I said, dear God, if this is meant to be, show me a sign. So I walk into the doorway, I see Dr. Lee, and he's about 60 years old, very handsome gentleman, business suit. But as soon as I see him, I see the sign right away, and it makes me smile. Because what it was, the sign, was a single band-aid right across his forehead. And at the time, I, my kids were one and two, and I was a mom. And as a mom, all I can think of as I, store, uh, as I stared at that band-aid was, he's got a boo-boo on his forehead. <laughs> so he's human, right? So he shook my hand, nice firm handshake, good eye contact, and then he pointed to his desk in a chair opposite, and he said, sit down. And I thought, wow, as I walked over, I thought, they're really different here at the White House. They do things rough. He doesn't believe in foreplay. This is before Bill Clinton. So I walk over to the desk. He sits down opposite me. I sit opposite him. And he launches into the interview right away. And he asked me, why do you want this job? And you all have been asked that numerous times. Why do you want this job? And the first thing that comes out of my mouth is this. Dr. Lee, it's payback time. I owe a lot to the United States of America. My father was a poor man when he joined the US Navy in the Philippines in the 1940s. He became an American citizen. He brought us here to this country. I was educated in the military medical school. I owe my career, my future, my life to this country. And if I can repay my debt by serving the commander in chief, that's what I want to do. So I look at Dr. Lee, there is no expression on his face. As they say in medicine, flat affect. As they say in Vegas, poker face. No expression. A few minutes later, he launches into the second question, what can you do here? And again, all of you know that. They ask you, what can you do? And at that time, I was a commander. I had three gold stripes on my sleeve. And I said, Dr. Lee, you see the stripes in my sleeve? The longer I'm in the Navy, the more stripes they put on my sleeve, the more they put me behind a desk. I'm not a desk doctor, I'm a trench doctor. You put me anywhere in the world, I know how to take care of patients. Once again, I look at his face, no expression, flat affect, poker face. And I'm feeling pretty bad at this time. I'm thinking, this is the worst interview of my life. There's no, this guy's not even feedback. 
So a few minutes later, he stands up abruptly in the middle of my interview, and so I stood up, and he says, as far as I'm concerned, we can stop the process right now. And I thought, oh, this is so demoralizing. I've totally blown it. He says, I don't care who we're interviewing today or tomorrow. You've got the job. I'm going to tell Barbara Bush. He shook my hand. He walked out the door, across the stairwell, up the elevator to the second floor of the White House residence to tell the First Lady. Meanwhile, I'm standing there looking, you know, like, what happened? And the uh, Dr. Roberts and the secretary were in the reception room and looking at me like, that was really fast. What happened? I said, well, I think I got the job. So the reason I love that true story are several fold. Um, it, it's an answer to a prayer about what happens next, but it's also talking or speaking with your true authentic voice. And I got asked a question by one of these 16-year-old scholars one time. I, I, I'm a medical director for an organization that encourages high school students to go into medicine, because I believe I want people to take care of me when I get older. And one of the 16-year-olds came up to me later and says, well, how do I know I'm you know, speaking with my true authentic voice? And I thought, oh my god, these kids are smart. And what I blurted out was, when you no longer have to pretend. And I think, how many times in my life did I have to pretend that I was one of the boys? How many times did I have to pretend I was something I wasn't inside? So that was my opportunity to speak with my true authentic voice. But the other lesson I learned was, it isn't about me. It's about giving back. And it's about doing that in service. So that's how I got to the White House. As fellow physicians, a lot of you are probably intrigued, well, what's it like taking care of the president? Three of them, three, three different presidents. It is very humbling. It is one of the rare times that the secretary will call you and say, doctor, the president will see you now. And so I think it's a very interesting experience. This photo was taken in the Oval Office. President Clinton had viral gastroenteritis on a Saturday when he was due to do, uh, do to have a taping uh, for a, uh, an event that afternoon, and his chief of staff called me and said, you need to get here right away. He doesn't look good. So I'm standing there, and he's sitting down. I'm standing up looking down at him, because you want to make sure he knows who's in authority. And I said, Mr. President, you know, you don't look good. I mean, you, are you pushing fluids? And he points to the glass of water and goes, I am. I am pushing fluids. I've got fluids there. Mr. President, the, the, the glass is full. You're not, you know, you need to take the day off. You need to rest. And he goes, I can't, I just can't do that. And, and we all very well know how power structures work that, you know, one of the secrets we know at the White House, if the president refuses to do what you want him to do, you appeal to higher authority. You say, Mr. President, if you don't do this, I will tell the First Lady, <laughs> at which the president will obey. So that's one way around it. Um, it is very humbling to take care of the First Family. It's like any other dynamics. Um, it's like any of your families that you take care of, except it's under a microscope and it's on TV all the time. But part of the, the role of the White House physician, in, take, in addition to taking care of the president 24-7, is the family and the inner circle and the people who travel with the president. And it gives you a lot of perspective about the influence of the president as a human being, who is in that inner circle, who's whispering, in his ear every morning, every night, who gets the influence of the president. What did I learn as a physician take, uh, nine years in the White House? It's always str strive for the highest standard of care, no matter where you are. One of the things I used to do is call my friends at Cleveland Clinic or Mayo or GW and say, hey, I've got a 47-year-old Caucasian male with reflux allergies, and what do you think? Would you do this? I just want to make sure that I'm doing what's appropriate to do that. And also, you know, I would tell people I'm a good doctor. I'm not the best doctor in the world, but I know how to find the best doctor in the world if I needed to get help for a particular issue. So always know when to find help. Always be humble enough to say, I don't know. I'm going to have somebody help me. I'm going to call in consultants because I don't know all the information. But it's interesting, a lot of times the, the intel that comes to me at the White House is the valet who calls me and says, Doc, he woke up and he was coughing this morning, or I heard him throw up. That's the valet telling you that. Or his assistant saying, you know, he didn't sleep last night. So all the information comes to you from all that inner circle that comes through you. But the biggest challenge really is balancing patient confidentiality with the public's right or public's 
demands to know that the president is healthy and is going to survive the presidency in good health. And that was always a challenge, trying to maintain that balance of respecting who they are as individuals, you know, not violating HIPAA, but what do you do when, you know, the government or the media wants to, the public wants to know that the president is healthy. A lot of people say, well, you know, you've got to the height of your career, you were at the White House, and then you got out, you retired from the Navy, now you can die, right? Well, of course not. You know, we're all going to live into our 80s and 90s and maybe 100. You know, what do you do? I mean, your life's not over. As uh, Nancy had mentioned this morning, we have many careers ahead of us. It can be medicine, and it can be branches of medicine, but we still have many things that we are we're blessed to do in our life, and I found that my life after the White House 14 years ago has been even more exciting and even more fulfilling. One of the things I realized being at the White House was I thought, you know, I, I want to go into private practice. So after four and a half years at the Mayo Clinic taking care of executives, I formed my own private practice 10 years ago at a time they started having calls here as care physicians. And one of the things I incorporated into my practice is something that I learned at the White House, is what I call my STAR principle. And I apply that to my practice, but also what I do in business. And I call it my STAR principle in the sense that it's about service to whoever we're serving. It's, the T is about trust, because a lot of times, you know, our patients lose trust in whether they'll be taken care of. The A is access, because, uh, you know, it's, a, it's our patients who want to have access to us and to the right information. And the R is really about the relationship. It's the relationship you have with our patients that I think is the most important, most rewarding part of medicine. And again, I, I strive to offer what I call presidential care to patients. I'm on call 24-7. Uh, that's a whole different story and book. There are television shows about uh, royal pains, but it, it gives you something to do, but also gives you a purpose. Um, in addition to that, I've had the opportunity to write a book. Uh, if you, you all have stories to tell of your lives and your journeys. I encourage all of you to consider writing your memoir one day to share, because I think other women, other trailblazers need, need to hear that, your story, because every single one of you has a story to, to tell. So please do that. Uh, the media, I think, is extremely powerful. Uh, Nancy Snyderman talked about it this morning. Your patients talk about what happens in the media, and I had fun doing that with the radio show. But I also believe it's important to have a life uh, and have a living, but you have to have a life. And I was really blessed, after 29 years of marriage, to end that marriage and move on to another marriage uh, five years ago. And one of the things I believe in, it's, you're, it's never too late to live happily after, ever after. And I found a, the perfect partner for me five years ago. Uh, but one of the many projects I want to do is write more books. Uh, the next book, I think, will be about the 11 presidential secrets to longevity. Look forward to writing that and having fun with it. But I want to wrap it up with seven words of wisdom, the take home message. And, and really, it's this. The first one is about focus. What is your focus now at this point in life? I have young women physicians come up to me and say, oh, Dr. Connie, you've, you've, had, you've done everything. You've had everything. I said, no, I don't think so. I, don't, I really think it's hard to have everything in life at the same time. You might have different things at different times. But you know, but focus is the most important. What is it right now in my life that is important? What do I want to achieve? What, I'm, what am I being called to do in this part of my life? And then the other part is flexibility. Be flexible to opportunities that come your way. Don't be rigid. Be open to things and new chances. Fear, forget it. And I'm, and I'm speaking, I'm singing to the choir. You're women who, who don't, you're not afraid. You wouldn't be here if you were afraid. Fun is important, friends are important, and these opportunities such as this celebration of AMWA is important to network and to share your experiences. Family and having people support you, and most of all, faith is important about who you serve in the end and your hyper, higher purpose. But with that, I want to end my remarks. I want to congratulate AMWA on its 100 years of achievement. But I also want to thank you for your courage, your spirit, and your wisdom in touching the lives around you. Thank you so much.